I realize it's a pipe dream to discuss categorical aspects of type theory in a short video. So instead, I'll focus on why they matter and list some good references. One major achievement of category theory is to capture various constructions and properties by equality between morphisms without referring to how things are concretely defined. It thus provides a unified language for concepts coming from different fields. As long as your morphisms satisfy the same equations, the same theorems apply. For example, an element in a set can be represented by a morphism from a singleton set. There is a one-to-one -one correspondence between elements in a set and morphisms from a singleton set. What's a singleton set? It's a set such that there is a unique morphism from any set, including itself. In category theory, an object satisfying this property is called the terminal object. We thus can redefine points as morphisms from the terminal object. The important thing is that the definition works for any category. For example, you can talk about the points in a graph or a group. The objects can be sets or anything else. The idea of keeping things abstract should sound familiar. We have been using abstraction to hide implementation details in computer programming. Category theory is mathematicians' way to do abstraction. A category theoretic concept can never refer to the internals of objects. The same holds for type theory. You know nothing about the pi or sigma types other than what the rules tell you. It turns out that there is a deep connection between ideas in type theory and those in category theory despite their distinct development histories. So, how does category theory describe an object without referring to its internals? The most common method is through universal properties as we did for the singleton sets earlier. The idea is to identify the types as the most general types satisfying some abstract properties. We have seen quite a few universal properties during the semester. Yes, I have been secretly teaching you category theory without saying the word category. For example, the natural number type is a more general type with a zero and a successor. The circle is a more general type with a point and a loop, and the identification types are the most general types with reflexivity. By the nature of category theory, these properties do not and cannot refer to any implementation detail and thus serve as excellent characterizations. As for type theory, two major parts can be rephrased in terms of categories. The first part is various types you have seen in type theory, such as the pi types, the sigma types, the natural number type, the homotopy pushouts, and so on. We can associate a category to a type theory and characterize the connectives up to homotopy by universal properties within this category. For simply type lambda calculus, we can use the category of types, but for dependent type theory, we need something more sophisticated. The second part is to treat the type theory itself as an object we want to characterize. Recall that we defined a natural number algebra as any type with a zero and a successor. We can do the same for a type theory, though it will be much more complicated. An object that looks like a cubical type theory will be something equipped with the structures for functions, pairs, paths, the interval, the composition and coercion, and so on. There are at least 10 different ways to write down what it means by something that looks like a type theory. Some are closer to the syntax, for example, demanding context to be of finite length. Some allow arbitrary context as long as they support all the operations on context. No matter how you define a type theory-like object, such objects will form a category where a morphism between two objects is an implementation that preserves all the type theoretic structures. Just like how the natural number type is the most general natural number algebra, the type theory will also be the most general object that looks like a type theory. Moreover, one can view every object that looks like a type theory as a model of the type theory, just like how every natural number algebra models the natural number type. As we have seen in previous lectures, using universal properties to describe individual types gives us insights behind their definitions. 
But what are the benefits of using universal properties to characterize a type theory? Many meta-theory results, such as normalization, were proved in an ad hoc manner, and recent progress showed that we might be able to systematically derive such results from the universal property of a type theory. To learn more about the categorical aspects of type theory, please check out the classic book Categorical Logic and Type Theory, written by the Dutch computer scientist Bart Jacobs, based on his PhD thesis. Or Categorical Logic by the English computer scientist Andrew Pitts, that is available online. That's all for today. Bye.